Welcome to Snooze with Sam. If you enjoy these stories, I'd love if you supported me by becoming a patron. Here you can get early access to every story, among many other benefits. You can find the link in the description. Whatever kind of day you've had, and whatever you're going through, let's be grateful for everything we have, even and especially the small and simple things. Right now, I'd like you to get comfortable and relax your mind. Tomorrow is a new day. So as always, lie back, take a deep breath, and enjoy this story. This story is called A Sleepy Journey Through Scotland. So what was all the fuss about with this North Coast 500 route? I was wondering the same just before we set off. Maybe thinking that there was too much fuss being made over it, that it was overhyped. But I was soon to learn that this trip, in fact, was everything it was promised to be. Naturally, of course, on the first day it was raining. But then we don't mind a bit of rain now, do we? The NC500, as it's come to be known, has been all the rage in Scotland, mainly for tourists, for years now. Coming from the Isle of Skye, I am well accustomed to gorgeous scenery and the peace and tranquillity of rural Scotland. So I'm probably not going to feel as wowed as the average adventurer, I thought to myself. Then again, I have an open mind and an appreciation for the smaller things in life. Maybe it'll blow my knitted tartan socks right off.
This route was conceived about 10 years ago as Scotland's Route 66. taking in many of the most remote and beautiful parts of Scotland, although omitting Sky, admittedly, as that would take it slightly off track, and the route would need to adopt a slightly less catchy North Coast 634 name, or something like that. Officially, the trip begins in Inverness, heading west towards Skye. The road then detours north, thus beginning the 500 mile-ish loop. Circumnavigating the whole of the northernmost portion of Scotland that was once upon a time rarely visited. I had always wondered what was north of Ullapool. I admit, I assumed that all of the local facilities would be run by sheep. And so should you require a favour from the locals, you would need to trade in tender grass or a scratch behind the ear. After packing our tents and basic supplies into the big estate car, that's a station wagon for you Americans. We began our journey from Inverness. We, for your information, comprise of myself, Sam, Martin and Jake. Two of my very best friends who happen to also be from Sky. Jake is a tall, slim and handsome man of Spanish descent, kind of, that the ladies and gentlemen swoon after. That'll be £40, Jake. His smile is as infectious as his chat. It's hard to believe that a small, isolated island produced this total knockout of a man. Martin, of course, is an equally handsome man. I have to say that, don't I? He perfectly embodies the islander. A man of fewer words, generous, with a heart of pure gold. And an amazing ability to listen and observe. He is effortlessly charming in his genteel nature. So three boys being boys on a week-long adventure. What could possibly go wrong?
Leaving Inverness, a pretty little city complete with its own impressive waterways and castle. We head northwest towards the depths of the highlands. First we cross the Keswick Bridge, making our way past Muir of Ord, and then turning off west towards Garve on the A835. Immediately we plunged into deep, lush forest. The road winding and roller coastering through the evergreen trees. The roads are still fairly busy at this stage. the route being a main connection to sky. After half an hour or so, we turn off onto the A832 and the scenery totally changes. In place of the dense trees, the landscape opens out into vast rolling bogs and young sapling plantations. The roads straight and highway-like by comparison, but naturally still fairly narrow. In the winter time, the higher altitude plunges these paths under snow. The red deer standing out like beacons against the white canvas. But even today, there are dozens not so far from the roadside. Totally iconic, we think. Perfectly fit for the front of a tin of shortbread. As locals, we know the consequences of encountering these wee beasts in a car all too well. I think we've all had at least one run-in with them, as they tend to stay close to the roads at night. But in the daylight, we admire these majestic animals in these gorgeous settings. Dinner, Jake pipes up from the back seat.
We all nod gently and agree that venison would be great for dinner. And that should he feel keen enough, he can fetch one if he wants to. But we also bring to his attention that he should know that it'll have to share the back seat with him. At which point he retracts his statement and we carry on. As the road continues, we pass little lochs and the small quaint villages of Achenalt, Achnesheen and Achneshelech. A lot of achs, I know. The green and brown bogs turn to golden bracken and shimmering purple heather. The road winding and weaving west, finally arriving at the village of Loch Carran. We are now deep in West Territories. And here we find an unoccupied field down by the water's edge. And set up our tents for the night. The steep glen on the far side of the loch imposing in the evening light. Thankfully the rain has subsided a little. So we gather round the fire and roast potatoes instead of venison. I was sitting down by the water, cooking up a flame-grilled storm, when the first sleepy head popped out of their tent. Morning, I said cheerily to Jake. The returning grumpy glance told me all about the quality of his sleep. Martin followed shortly after, similar expression on his tired face. Throughout the night, barking and rutting red deer had been the entertainment. as well as the usual 4am dawn chorus of a billion birds. We wondered what they have for breakfast to create such a cacophony.
Maybe a sugar-laden cereal washed down with rocket fuel coffee, perhaps. I had been preemptive of the rough camping sleeps and brought a set or two of earplugs. These were now high on the day's shopping list for both Martin and Jake. We sat by the water, ate our breakfast, packed away our life belongings, and excitedly hit the road. Today was one of our most eagerly anticipated days. Definitely one of the most famous locations in Scotland. The road to the tiny village of Applecross, Belach was on our agenda. And it is a sight to behold. We were excited to say the least. Thankfully, after the wet and typically Scottish day which proceeded, the sun had broken through and promised a day of fine weather. Seemingly not yet exhausted from the pre-theatre performance, the birds continued to sing wherever we went. Occasionally accompanied by the backing vocals of sheep. Soaking in the sun-drenched glens, loch views and blue skies, we climbed north out of Loch Carron, gaining altitude with every switchback and hairpin bend. The road weaved and winded its way up the hillside and stretched over the moors towards Ardarach. A little further down the road, we turned off towards Applecross at Torna Press. The main event awaited. From here, the road narrowed mostly single track with occasional passing places. A 
and somehow the climb steepened even further with an abundance of blind corners and crests. And then there it was, right in front of us. The Glen of Belach Naba. Traversing the sides of the Glen the road sidled its way up and up until we reached the most dramatic series of hairpin bends. Every one of them turning a full 180 degrees back on itself. It felt like being on a roller coaster, climbing at impossibly steep angles. Peering down into the glen far below, under the shadows of Ben Van and the surrounding mountains which hung menacingly overhead. We were totally in awe. Then, reaching the top of the glen, we parked up and just stood there, totally stunned by the ribbon of tarmac below, disappearing away at the bottom of the climb. We were still processing the previous views when we were met with the next panorama. An unrestricted view across to the lush west coast islands of Razé and Skye, the sea sparkling in the foreground. It only struck us here just how high up we were. And yet again, funnily enough, the views were to die for. She's no bad, eh? We all muttered in turn, quietly amused at the understatement of the century. For the next stop, we descended down into Applecross itself, at the Applecross Inn.
Here we had the most beautiful lunch of local fish and chips, sat outside on a bench by the sea. As if they were following us around everywhere we went, a couple of fairly tame roe deer were hovering by all the patrons. Perhaps they were just there for the company and the casual chat. Maybe for a cold pint, but very likely just for the food. Thankfully for the sake of everyone's conscience, venison was not on the menu that day. We relaxed here, blissfully unaware of time, bathing in the sunlight with the sounds of the lapping shoreline for company. Our overnight stay was still a few hours away, so we set off around the coast of the Applecross Peninsula. A simple, battered, winding, single track road. It was not a comfortable ride, but surprise, surprise, the views were incredible. As if on the edge of the world, the road stayed high overlooking the sea and the islands below. The spectrum of colours was ethereal, deep teals of the water, the tantalising richness of the heathers, bracken and grasses lining the hillside. And, of course, the grandeur of the distant Hebridean islands. admired in silence the sheer beauty of what we were witnessing. Rolling ever so gently along the road towards the sunset. Wishing it would never end.
I never tired of Jake struggling with his overcomplicated tent. Neither did Martin, for that matter. Granted, it was very windy and our tents were basic items. They would practically throw themselves up if you asked nicely enough. Yet of course they wouldn't stand up to a really windy night. But, unless you were mountaineering, it was hard to argue with the two-minute ritual of deployment and packing away. So we just stood there, by a river in Kinloch U, laughing at Jake as he struggled, fettled and swore the tent into its tiny bag. We timed the procedure the night before. Our bare necessity outfits took 95 seconds to erect. Jake was there for over 10 minutes. We would help, Martin remarked, but watching you is much more entertaining. Can I offer you any moral support? I asked. Perhaps a bit of light heckling? Or a pat on the back? Aside from the frustrated rustling of tarpaulin and nylon outer skins, the response was minimal. Of course, because we're not actually terrible friends, after we'd had our wee laugh, we did give him a helping hand. That morning, we continued our journey north, aiming for Alapu by the end of the day. Alapu is a pretty port village of around 1,500 people. Despite its small size, it's an important lifeline to the northernmost areas of Scotland. Through the glens we drove, the sense of isolation and remoteness growing after every mile we passed. Above our heads, red kites and golden eagles patrolled the skies. Using every last drop of thermal energy to help them upwards. A 
as powerful as these bards are. The wind was even a little too much for them every so often. You would all too frequently see a steadying wing outstretch or tuck to remain balanced. The road twisted and winded alongside the stunning Loch Marie. A proper loch, as Jake said. I bet that thing is full of fish, he pondered. Just looks like it, doesn't it? Aye, I replied. But see that lock over there? That looks like it's full of chips. The dry, expressionless dad joke only succeeded in raising an eyebrow or two. I counted that as a resounding success. Nearing the beach village of Gerloch, the lay of the land eased just a little. Along the road, we spotted a brown sign which pointed towards Red Point Beach. Curious, we decided we were feeling arrogant enough that no weather would stop us from enjoying a good beach. Maybe even a dip if the bravado tank was topped up. For around 20 minutes, we wound along a small coastal road. Dodging wee potholes and sidestepping sheep until we came across the beach itself. huge, stretching, amber-coloured sand runway, backed with tall and grassy dunes. Greyish skies towered overhead, flecked with sunlight breaching the clouds. The tide was out, the water away in the distance. Yet the waves were large, crashing onto the beach. A 
Who's coming in then? Martin piped up. And with this one question, he opened the car door, stepped out, and began removing his clothes. What a total fruitcake, Jake said. And before he'd even finished stating that, he too stepped out of the car and took himself down to his scuddies. So as not to be the only one left out, I sighed, left the car running, turned the heater up to full, and too stepped out of the car and began undressing. Before we knew it, we were in full sprint, charging the waves. I tried to trip up Martin, but he was having none of it, and retaliated with a firm shove of the shoulder. We didn't care that it was probably too shallow. All three of us dived head first into the water. Within 20 seconds, all three of us were running back to the car, desperate for a towel and some heat. Finally warmed through, our journey around the coast continued through the winding and twisting roads of Pouillou and Drumcourt. The sun yet again breaking through the grey clouds and accompanying us onwards towards the end of the day. Around every corner was a little peninsula or a sandy bay. A smattering of uninhabited islands or a small woolen farm. This was rural Scotland at its finest. Before long, we rejoined a main road, 
beneath the summit of Ben Jerak. That's Gaelic for red, by the way. And headed west for Ullapu. They can safely say that that night, as the evening sun glistened off the now still waters of Loch Broom, I fell in love with Scotland all over again. Martin, why are you wearing a dress? Jake asked, waking him from a coma spec sleep. Eh? What are you talking about? He glanced down through sleepy eyes to see that he was in fact, wearing a rather fetching strapless number. Which was a little risky in length, if I'm honest. Good heavens, he muttered. That's fantastic. Jake stared at me, manic grin on his face, confirming his honest feelings about the matter before us. I had no idea at all about how he came to be wearing such an article. For the predictable power of single malt had issued its wrath. Only the empty bottle of Glendronach cask strength on the floor could possibly tell the tale. But my own fascination was that there must be some woman out there who woke up this morning wearing an equally flattering check shirt, straight cut jeans and cat boots. A wild night in the pubs of Alapool it certainly was, the locals appreciating our own not too distant origins. So we listened to the local accordion and guitar duo, drinking like fish, 
sharing mutual connections and stories of Highland life. Before somehow ending up back at our B&B. With not a single memory of how we managed it. Nursing our fevered brows, we attempted a cup of tea, left half of it, before hurrying out of Alapu. We were in desperate need of some fresh air to blow off the Speyside dram cobwebs. We took a glance outside. The sky was full of dark, lightless storm clouds looking menacing. It seemed like we were in luck on the invigorating weather front, if that's what we were needing. Today we were to aim for the little village of Skuri, with a detour via Achmelvich Beach to drink in the coastal sights. Having fueled up for the journey ahead, we slowly set off northbound up the A835 yet again. All three of us quietly praying for the hangover to subside a little. The distance between tiny hamlets and villages grew more and more. The hilly heathered moors forcing the road to sway side to side over the terrain. We seemed to be the only souls on the road for miles, the storm threatening to strike at any moment. Over the next few hours, we cruised calmly along the road taking in the continuous, stunning views through Ascent and Enchnadamp. For miles, tiny little lochs littered the landscape. Deer 
in every direction we looked, with numerous Monroes ever present in the distance. Monroes, by the way, are a series of titled mountains in Scotland which reach above an altitude of 3,000 feet. There are 227 in total. Turning off towards Achmelvech, we arguably entered the most remote corner of the whole of Britain. The road narrowed to a single track and we shared the whole way with many a sheep and cow. Every day on the trip we swore we felt even more remote than the former, but this one took the biscuit. Looking out over the west coast waters, craggy coastline beneath a dark and stormy sky providing the drama. Western Isles and Hebridean Islands populating the sea, there was no real evidence of people existing at all. Just nature untouched. Add to that the sheer colour palette of the weather which seemed to turn up the saturation of everything. The vivid greens of the grass and the old oak and alder trees. The ambers of old bracken. And the deep purples of the thunderclouds. It was a special moment we all shared. Crikey, that's a fair sight out in the sticks, I said. and the other two agreed. Here in the middle of nowhere,
appeared to be a total feat of engineering. The famous Kailescu Bridge, spanning a curved gap between two sides of a loch, the banks falling away steeply at each side, all covered with vibrant yellow gorse bushes. It was quite a spectacle from the road. The huge arcing road curving elegantly like a snake. Held up by thoroughly modern looking trapezoidal struts disappearing into the water below. We could imagine just how incredible it would look from the air. To see a structure so striking out here in the wilderness was undeniably breathtaking. The flow of the road lending to the nature of the landscape. As the thunder rolled, the rain fell gently, creating a gloomy mist out over the sea to our left as we journeyed on towards Scurry, our overnight stop. We heard rumours of there being a single petrol pump in this village. And that sometimes it was out of action or totally empty altogether. We'd better hope not, I said. Otherwise, you two are pushing. On the fifth day, we were all awake early on, around 6am, the spring turned summer light already in full force.
But it wasn't the light which woke us from our sleeps. There was something else as well. The light rattles and taps of hailstone on our tents and on the car roof. Like a natural alarm clock, we all unzipped our tents, poked our heads out of the gaps, and were immediately greeted by something extraordinary. We had to lift a hand to our eyes to shield our sight from the low rising sun. Its rays striking us at full bore. Not only was the sun rising, with its hot pinks and oranges illuminating the clouds and sky with a myriad of textures and hues. But the combination of the sunlight through the hail was something none of us could remember seeing in our past lives. Different to rain diffusing the light, the hail stood stronger in the air. Like a thicker curtain, one with mass. There was a whiteness to the air, like a mystical cloud which just hung there, softly in space. I could imagine this was the kind of sight which inspired a generation of watercolour artists in the Victorian era. It was a view which would stir the soul, regardless of any soundtrack. But the reality of anything, the occasional thump on the nose of a larger than average hailstone was enough to shake us out of our daydream. It truly was one of those pinch-yourself moments. So, admittedly, we allowed a little mist to enter our eyes.
It was now time to start our day. Further and further north we ventured. Our aim to reach the very north of Scotland, near Durness. For such a small country, it felt as though the wilderness never ended. Just more and more open space, fewer and fewer villages, and narrower and narrower roads. Although getting lighter occasionally, the hail continued, sometimes turning to rain when the air warmed. It kept the roads glistening in the broken sunshine. We turned up the final stretch of the A838 through the furthest outreaches of Sutherland. Durness was but only 30 miles away or so, and then we were at the top of mainland Great Britain. Look, Martin exclaimed, we be be coos. And he was right. Just by the road, on the far side of a barbed wire fence, stood a mother highland cow and its calf. Soggy ginger fringes hiding their eyes, they chewed slowly and deliberately on some very tasty grass. Shall we give them a little company? Jake asked. They look a bit bored. Pulling over the car dutifully, we all braced ourselves for the wet hail to rattle our noggins once more, causing us to wince against the stinging artillery. Bagsy the wee one, I said, reaching out the back of my hand, inviting a wee safety sniff from the wee hairy cow. By the way, Bagsy is often a term we use for dips. It did so, as invited, 
throwing its damp nose out in a tree, followed by a curious lick, as if to confirm I wasn't a danger, but also that I wasn't grass. The mother coo seemed to side-eye the proceedings, almost taking heed of the calf. Both Martin and Jake then offered a similar inviting palm full of tender grassy shoots. The mother hesitated, poker face intact, giving nothing away. Even against the hail, we could hear the cowy cogs turning away slowly in her head. Calculating. Pros versus cons. Gain versus losses. After what felt like an eternity, then And only then did she reach out her neck, tongue protruding, and inhaled the grass. It seemed as though after a long and arduous thinking process, she had made up her mind. Or maybe she just forgot what she was thinking about. Weaving a little goodbye to the hairy coos, we set our sights on the small village ahead. Welcome to Durness, the sign read. And what a welcome it was. In a matter of seconds, the hail seemed to recede, letting the sunlight hit in all its warm and toasty energy. Secretly, we had all been looking forward to this one place near Durness. And that place was Smoo Cave, a famous hot spot for all those circumnavigating the North Coast 500. Sidling off the main road, we headed for a small car park, lined with tufty, 
barren landscape grass. And when we emerged onto it, we were once again greeted by the wonderful sounds of the crashing North Sea waves. We followed the signs walked around the wee slatted paths until there, immediately before us, in almost unbelievable theatre, was Smoo Cave. An incredible sea cave carved into the rock cliffs It looked like a giant's lair, the back of the cave descending into total darkness, hiding anything from view. Looking at each other, with a slight grin, we hopped off the path and made our way into the mouth of the cave. You go first, Sam. No, honestly, Jake, on your cell. Nah, you pair of pansies. Out the road, I'll go in. Between us, we shuffled, bickered, and cohered each other into leading the way into the endless gloom. From where we stood, maybe 30 metres from the mouth of Smoo Cave, the light had begun to vanish surprisingly rapidly thanks to an overhanging rock. This overhang more than half the available light to see. And it wasn't long before we were stumbling about and losing our footing. And then we got the dreaded heebie-jeebies.
We've left our shoes at the entrance of the cave and rolled up our trousers so that the stream coming out of the cave wouldn't soak us too much. But the water got deeper and deeper until it reached our knees. Not only did it deepen, but it got colder. Free of any warming sunshine or milder air. Further and further we waded in, single file through the water. Feeling our way, testing the earth beneath the water's surface. Feeling every piece of gravel, sediment and stone shift beneath our weight. Despite the darkness and eerie atmosphere, there was something nice about that feeling beneath our feet. The gentle pressures applied by each size of stone gently massaged our souls, all in different ways. The cool water added to each sensation. All in all, it was a nice feeling. Quite soothing. Just as we supposed the light would disappear altogether, something loomed at the far end of the cave. Not just visually, but audibly too. Jake was up ahead of me, I think, and his shape began to become a silhouette against the cave. Some light ahead of him defining his edges, highlighting his facial features. In place of the slowly fading sound of the waves from the sea, came the distinctive slap of water on water, like a little waterfall or heavy stream.
There must be something up ahead. Typically, we all got excited at the prospect of light. I was starting to get a bit scared, Martin laughed. Both Jake and I quietly agreed. A little further and a little further we went, the noise growing louder, the light getting brighter. The glow was not just your usual daylight, however. It held a more orange tinge, like that of a fire. Our intrigue grew stronger still. Just like that, as we rounded one last corner, there was the show-stopping view we guessed this incredible cave was famous for. Above, on the ceiling on the far side of the cave, a hole to the sky. About two meters wide, it let in light so bright to our eyes we had to hold our hands up to shield our dark, accustomed retina. Through this hole fell not only daylight, but a small stream which accelerated and blistered downwards towards the water's surface below. Creating sharp smacks and slaps on its surface. From the water rose great plumes of vapour and spray which circulated around the cave, catching the light. But it wasn't just the daylight shining brightly through the hole. That of a 
a sodium lamp buried deep in one of the smaller channels of the cave. into the rock. It created an image like a dragon's lair. The fire-breathing beast Hot with pent rage, fury, and emotion. This fiery glow shone off the surface of the rippling water, magnifying its effects, bringing it to life. We were stunned. Collectively, we took a few minutes in deep silence to appreciate what was before us. A few minutes turned into ten. Then twenty. We weren't really sure how long we did spend in the cave. In the end. I don't think any of us wanted to leave. Our drive along the very north of Scotland was peaceful. The evening sun glowed sleepily in the scattered, wispy clouds. The gentle breeze blew in off the sea, cool and salty. A suitable flavour for the views we absorbed for mile after mile of coastal Scottish highway. As we neared Thurso, the largest town of the north of Scotland. We made sure to stock up on goodies for a well-deserved barbecue after such a long day on the road.
Rounding the last few bends whilst entering the furthest north part of mainland Britain, John O'Groats. The cherry on our cake was setting eyes on the Orkney Islands for the first time. Visiting them wasn't on our agenda. But then again, life is short. The concept of the bucket list can be a little contrived sometimes. Of course, every day should be lived and appreciated to its fullest, even if it's only filled with the small, everyday things. But us three men could all agree that what we were about to do was firmly on our own lists, should we have had them. An early morning our long ferry crossing from Gills Bay had been the start of our day trip to the Orkney Islands. A formidable archipelago set off the north coast of Scotland. A community, a society, a lifestyle in its own right. The people of Orkney are a content bunch, finding satisfaction and fulfilment in their lives where others struggle. They embrace their isolation from the mainland, using it to create a tighter knit community and better quality living for its residents. It's frequently been voted one of the best places to live in the whole of the United Kingdom.
We left the car on the mainland and embarked onto the ferry on foot. The sailing was choppy but thrilling nonetheless. The large catamaran swaying gently from side to side and pitching up and down. We cruised past the sparsely inhabited islands of Stroma, Swona and Flotta. All of which shone like jewels under the haze diffused sunshine. The air was cool, the breeze bracing but the sun restored balance. Pulling into the shelter of the island of Burry. The breeze fell away as the boat caught at the pier, lining up its approach. It was then that I spotted the familiar sight of my very good friend and Orkney resident, David weaving in the distance. He was stood adjacent to his car and trailer. And in his trailer were three motorcycles. Both Martin and myself had ridden motorbikes since our late teens, one encouraging the other. We reveled in the freedom, the power and the fun of the two-wheeled life. Jake, a late starter to our hobby, had recently acquired his license. So what better way to celebrate our first outing as a trio than a full lap of Orkney on three of Dave's classic bike collections. We'd soak in all the sights and sounds of this awesome place. Oh, and of course, Dave later fetched a fourth bike and came along too. We insisted, naturally. I hope you didn't think we were going to leave him behind. (laughs) 
firing up our bikes. A lovely Triumph T100 Bonneville. A Honda VFR. And a Valkyrie 1500. We left St. Margaret's Hope. Engines singing and thumping. Down the very south of Orkney and settled into the lovely sweeping roads and causeways of the southern islands. The stunning Italian chapel was our first stop. Constructed by Italian prisoners of war during the Second World War. Using any materials and tools they could get their hands on. This Roman architecture time capsule reeked of romantic tragedy. Just off the shore of one causeway, a beautiful old fishing boat wreck perched comfortably on a sandbank. Evidently having not moved for many, many years. It's tired old hardwood, softened and soaked with seawater. Faint flecks of red paint hinted at its former glory. Deep in your imagination, you could see it rolling over the waves, ropes and creels trailing, men hard at work away for weeks at a time. Onwards to the pretty town of Kirkwall we ventured, Orkney's capital. Here we took a leisurely tour around the stunning Highland Park and Scapa Whisky Distilleries. All of us being fans of a rich single malt, we reveled in this experience, admiring the copper tons, oak barrels, and the strong smell of malty spirit lingering in the air.
we allowed ourselves very small tastings of the local nectar, but I promise, very small. Hungry from our awakened palate, we stocked up on the local produce at the Brig Larder in town. Staple delicacies like Orkney cheese, flaky biscuits and sumptuous smoked salmon. It was a lunch fit for four leather-clad kittens. All fueled up for an afternoon's riding, we set out north from Kirkwall, prepped for a good long cruise. We soaked in the sea air, gazing out over the smaller isles of Gersey, Rousse and Westray. All complete with their own unique little communities. I suppose it was at this point we all took a minute or two to appreciate what we were doing. Four friends, four gorgeous motorcycles thudding away gently and barely breaking a sweat. in the exquisite serenity of some of Scotland's most rural and beautiful parts. Circling around the north coast of the mainland, seagulls squawking irritably overhead. The salty North Sea air fresh on our tongues. We climbed and descended the coastal cliffs of Barsi, giving room for some spectacularly high views. Another quick stop at the Koilu Brewery for some more delicious pub food and my favourite beer of Dark Island. We aimed for a small village near Strumness called Outerton with one particular site in mind.
trundling in, all of the bike's cylinders thudding away. We pulled up in a small dirt patch at the end of the road, in a line of four, side by side. The sun was now low, nearing the horizon. The sky turning all typical shades of bronze, auburn and remnants of daytime sapphire. We switched our engines off, waiting for the silence to drop. Dismounted our bikes and let the views of the old man of Hoy sink in. Picked out in the distance by the prevailing sunset, this 450 foot tower of red sandstone stood defiantly off the coast of Hoi. Equally dramatic cliffs in its shadow. Like a local Orcadian giant guarding the islands from incomers. The old man saw the sun down that night. Under the misty and watchful eyes of four stout and emotional friends. Boarding the ferry back to mainland Scotland with something none of us will ever forget. It was 7pm in St Margaret's Hope. Cars were queuing to get on. Headlights pushing through the gloom and torrential rain. 
Windscreen wipers at full chat. The boat crew screamed commands to drivers and foot passengers alike, shielding their eyes from the violent rain and wind. Doing their best to urge everyone into some form of order. Children were crying, terrorised by the noise, the thunder and the lightning. The boat swaying side to side, even in port. The captain had fired up the engines and wrestled the wheel in an effort to keep the catamaran from colliding with the pier whilst everyone boarded. Jake, Martin and I helped all the young, the families and the elderly aboard first. Our needs less so than theirs. The storm was coming. This ferry was a lifeline to Orkney. The only connection for families to the mainland in weather like this. The ramp was raised and the ropes were detached. The engines roared. The boat lurched into forward propulsion. It was now or never. As the ferry rounded the headland, out into open water, the sides were suddenly hit by a wall of wind and water. The cabins shook violently. Every wave like a battering ram against the steel and enamel paint. Every third or fourth wave, the boat would nosedive into a trough as if falling from a cliff and a sense of vertigo overwhelmed everyone. Then out of nowhere the bow would pick up, sending us skywards before returning to Earth.
This pattern repeated the whole way to Scotland. He stared out of one of the small windows, clinging to a nearby railing. The sea was a mass of alpine waves, white foam and breaking white horses. The thunder and lightning raged overhead, directly above the channel. Great flashes and booms thundering through the steelwork, even above the storm itself. What was rainfall and what was sea spray, it was impossible to tell. It was all one and the same thing, a giant combination of all elements at this point. Whatever it was, the window was being battered by it. Then what was once a wave 30 feet below would suddenly rush up towards the glass and engulf it, plunging the portal underwater. The resulting waves found gaps in the steelwork, around doors in the walkways outside. It was terrifying. All three of us with sweat on our brow, stayed close. We urged the boat onwards, trying our best to keep our balance. A long hour passed. The boat being tossed around by the North Sea. It took 15 minutes for the skipper to skillfully manoeuvre the hulking catamaran into position at Gills Bay. Carefully timing his approach so as not to crash into the dock.
Everyone breathed a great sigh of relief, knowing that they were nearly on to the next part of their journey. The boat still rocked heavily from side to side and pitched up and down. Stepping off onto dry land was still a treacherous process. The ramps clattering, creaking and graunching on the concrete slip. Us foot passengers left first, crossing as quickly as we could so as to avoid any risk of being knocked over by the weather. Within seconds, we were soaked again. The taste of the sea salt forced into our mouths. The gale ripping through our clothes as if they were netted gauze. Jake had the car key, and we were relieved to see it was still where we left it. Although it was covered in debris, which had been picked up by the wind. We leapt behind the closed doors for safety, pulling off our waterlogged garments. Breathless and panting, we quietly watched as the mainland dwelling friends and families welcomed their loved ones in deep embraces, helping them to shelter in a car or an outbuilding. Everyone was as relieved as us. Staring at the sky and listening to radio announcements, we calculated determined and measured the rest. We needed to make it to Inverness.
so long as the roads remained open and intact. We were confident we could make it. From the very northern tip of Scotland, we set off south. Through the battered, bruised, and beaten coastal landscapes of Barren, Caithness, and Sutherland, we wrestled. We fought against the wind coming off the sea in an effort to keep the car on the straight and narrow. Trees fell, hail descended like artillery and cars aquaplaned off the road. This was no easy journey at all. Through these ordinarily beautiful landscapes, we trundle, never taking our eyes off the road, feared of losing concentration for a moment, with terrible results. The sky above looked angry, moody, and ready to burst into fury again and again. And each time it did. We braced ourselves again for the rain to come. Through the granite appearance of Wick, historic clearance village, of Helmsdale, pretty town of Golsby, and the whisky capital of Tain, we drove and ploughed through the standing water and fallen trees. Just praying for the storm to subside even a little.
Something or someone must have heard our wishes. Because as we neared Inverness, our safety point, the wind just dropped like a stone. And then, almost as quickly, the rain ended, as if switched off like a tap at the source. We stared at each other in amazement. The windscreen wipers on the car drying and squeaking in a matter of seconds. Yes, weather changes quickly, but in a matter of a minute or so. We were stumped. Just along the coast of the Cromarty Firth, not far from the beautiful Dalmore distillery, we pulled the car over by the seashore. It was truly bizarre, as here we were, standing outside in the elements, with barely a breeze to rustle our hair. But we looked upon waves which still tumbled and crashed onto the beach. Still a living memory of the winds which had pushed them not ten minutes before. The sky still churned overhead, but there was a difference in the light. whisper of golden sunset lurked on the horizon in a different land. One that was different to our own in that moment. But it was a promise of sorts. As we crossed the Keswick Bridge, reunited with roads we had journeyed upon less than a week before, we reflected on our time on the North Coast 500.
just as we had thought we'd seen it all and experienced everything. We were plunged into the finale. A true test of Scottish grit and spirit. We'd all weathered storms before. It's a regular part of life up here especially coming from an island. But something would have felt missing from our trip if we hadn't felt the full spectrum of diversity. Because that's what Scotland is all about. It's incredible diversity. The scenery, the weather, the food, the drink, and the people. So as we spanned the Moray Firth once again, we left the highlands and raised an imaginary glass to Scotland and all it represents. On the final night of our North Coast 500 trip, Jake, Martin and myself left the storm behind and aimed towards the setting sun.